Turn your Bibles to John chapter 11, verses 38 to 44, scripture we read last week. Then Jesus, again groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me, and I know that you always hear me. But because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Now, when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, Loose him and let him go. The title of our message is the command, Come Forth. Last week we studied the command, Take Away the Stone, from this very lesson. We likened the death of Lazarus to spiritual death because of sin, and Lazarus' tomb to the tomb of sin that binds sinners and keeps them in sin. We saw that Jesus could have miraculously moved the stone from the tomb, but instead he commanded those who were with him to move the stone away. The command to take away the stone at the tomb of Lazarus we saw was equivalent to Jesus' command to preach the gospel, a task given to all in the church, not just to the ministers. So always keep that in mind. It isn't just those on the paid church staff that have the responsibility. If you are the church, if you are part of the church, it is your responsibility, all of us, to declare, spread the gospel. Without sharing the gospel, people in sin cannot hear Jesus calling them out of the tomb of sin to salvation. But with our sharing the gospel, and opening the tomb of sin for them, Jesus also gives the command to come forth. It wasn't enough just to have the stone rolled away. As important as that was, as necessary as that was, this command was extremely important to Lazarus and the miracle that needed to happen in his life. Come forth. Being saved from sin requires a choice and an action on the part of the sinner. Sin is always a choice. Sin is always a choice. No one accidentally falls into sin. Yes, some sins become habitual and the sinner feels as if he has no choice in the matter, but a choice is always involved when people sin. The first choice was to commit that first sin. That was the first choice. The next and the ongoing choice was to continue committing that sin and any other sins that you committed. Eventually, sin becomes so habitual that committing it becomes automatic and the sinner commits sin without even thinking. It's in his nature. He does it. It's natural to him. The sin became binding then. And when the sinner wants to stop, stop that particular uh, behavior, he finds that he cannot stop it. And it appears to him that he has no choice anymore. That's why we call it bondage. Sin is a bondage. In John chapter 8, verse 34, Jesus says, Everyone that committeth sin is the bondservant of sin. The Apostle Paul gave a testimony when he was lost in sin. 
in Romans 7, verse 14, he says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of, of flesh, sold into bondage to sin. There is bondage in sin. Sin always starts with a choice, and a choice to do it again, and a choice to do it again. It becomes habitual, becomes part of the nature. But then one does find that he is bound in sin. In fact, the New Testament gives us the picture that people committing sin are hopelessly bound and lost in their sins. But friends, this is not the will of God for people. God has a different life planned for every one of us. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, the Bible says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, sinners are dead in sin. Sinners are entombed in the tomb of their sin. But that's not God's will for them. God's will is that they not perish, but that they repent and come to salvation. That call to repentance is Jesus' call to the sinner to come out of his tomb of sin. This is consistent throughout the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus began His earthly ministry preaching this very thing. In Mark chapter 1, verse 15, Jesus says, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Jesus is saying to sinners, Come forth. Repent and believe the gospel. And friend, his message has not changed for 2,000 years. It has always been the same. For generations of people in sin, those that have had the stone rolled away, those that have heard the gospel message, have known it was necessary to repent and to believe the gospel. That is the call to come forth. And friend, it is the same for you today. The message has not changed. Jesus has not modernized the message. He has not made it more politically correct. He says, repent and believe the gospel. That is His command. The word repent in the Greek is the Greek word metanoeo, meaning to think differently or to change one's mind. That's the meaning of that word. So wherever you see the word repent, you can insert to think differently or to have a change of mind. Now, repentance involves four things. It's not just one thing. It involves four things in order to be a complete and full repentance. It involves, first of all, recognizing and admitting to sin and to one's helplessness to stop sinning. The sinner has to recognize he or she is a sinner and that he or she cannot stop sinning. Maybe you can stop the sin this time, but you will do it again. Now, all sinners do not commit all sins. Some sinners never commit adultery. Some sinners never kill. But they do other sins. So even if you just did one sin, one kind of sin, you're going to find yourself helplessly lost in sin and unable to stop committing that sin. The second thing, it involves recognizing that one has violated God's moral laws and to have a sorrow that you have done that. 
Sinning isn't just doing a bad thing. Sinning isn't just doing a wrong thing. Sinning is sinning against God. Now you may have hurt somebody else. You may have lied to somebody else. You may have been angry and, and you know just hurt somebody in some way, shape, or form. <clears throat> but listen, sin goes beyond that. It violates God's moral laws. God is the one who determines good and evil. He did that before the world began. And He's not changed any definition of good or evil. He's not decided that some things that were good are now evil and some things that were evil are now good. God has not changed. He does not change His mind. And you need to see that in what you did, even if it was just a little white lie, even if it was just a little sin, even if you sinned for what you thought was the right reason, you have violated God's moral law. And you need to have a sorrow. You need to feel bad that you have done that. The third thing, repentance involves honestly and sincerely seeking God's pardon from those sins. It's a change of mind, change of direction. You've got to quit sinning and go another way. But only God can help you to do that. And a person who is truly repenting falls before God and recognizes I have to have God's intervention in my life in order to stop sinning. And fourth, it involves changing one mind and abhorring his sins so much that he wills to stop sinning. Yes, you have to will to stop sinning. I told you just a moment ago that sin is always a choice. Sin is an act of your will. And being saved from sin requires an act of your will. And with your will, you have to will to stop sinning. This means more than you just got to you know, want to stop sinning. You've got to be determined to stop sinning. You also will notice that in preaching His message, Jesus did not stop with just requiring repentance. He said, repent and believe the Gospel. And He had a reason for adding belief in the Gospel. You see, there has to be a basis upon which a repentant person can actually stop sinning. And it is not just his own willpower. Yes, your willpower is involved. But your willpower is not strong enough to stop sinning. You need something more. Okay, There is a grace that you need from God. How many times does the sinner want to stop sinning, but he finds that he can't do it? You know, the drunk hates that he's a drunk. And when he sobers up, he says, I'll never do that again. The shoplifter hates that she steals from the stores. And after she gets home and sees all the stuff that she's stolen, she says, I'll never do it again. But the drunk always goes back to his drink. The shoplifter always goes back to her shoplifting. The adulterer always goes back to his and hers adultery. The liar always goes back to his lying. The sinner wants to stop, but he can't. It requires God's grace to quit and to give up sin once for all. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Talk about supernatural religion. Christianity is not just a set of beliefs. Christianity is just not going to church as the world would think. Christianity is a relationship with God that changes us from being a sinner
to being a child of God, to being a holy one, a saint. Believing the gospel means to believe and accept this grace of God. But believing this is not something you have to do on your own. How many sinners have heard the gospel and they thought, well, I want to believe that. I would like to believe that. But I just find that I can't. You see, God gives a gift of faith. Something that is more than just your will. And that gift of faith is ability to believe and ability to truly repent of your sins. Your salvation, while it requires an act of your will, is a miracle of the hand of God in your life. That's encouraging. That should help any sinner have hope that he or she can be saved from their sins, kept from their sins, that they can be changed. It's a miracle. It's grace. It's a gift of God. It comes from something that you don't have in yourself. God gives you that faith. God gives you that grace. And there's one more thing involved in being saved. Acts chapter 2 verse 21 says, Whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. I like that. Didn't say might be saved. Has a good chance of being saved. He says, if you call on the name of the Lord, you will be saved. Hallelujah. Isn't that a comforting thought? Doesn't that give you encouragement? One does not just will himself into salvation, although an act of your will is required. Once you have repented and believed through faith that God will forgive you and will help you to stop sinning, you have to call out to God. That is, you have to ask God to forgive you and take away your sins. They don't go away magically. They don't go away just by willpower. They go away because you have asked God to forgive you and to take away that sin. I thank God in this scripture we have the assurance that your sins are in fact forgiven. That you have been raised from spiritual death to spiritual life and thank God you can come out of your tomb of sin. But the good news, if that's not good news enough, the good news is that you are not alone in your new life. You do not have to figure it out on your own. Because you see in the lesson, there is a third commandment. Jesus commanded those witnessing this miracle of Lazarus coming to life to loose him and let him go. Lazarus came out of the grave still bound with his grave clothes. Just picture that. Here he is. I mean, all tied up. I mean, just all around. I don't even know how he was able to get off, off the little thing that they laid the body on. It had to be an effort to kind of roll over and push himself off. And then, you know, he'd have to go like this because his feet weren't loose, his legs weren't separated. He just had to just kind of scooch himself around. I guess scooch is a word, I don't know. All right. Still bound in his grave clothes, could barely move. And he certainly could not take off the grow clothes, excuse me, the grave clothes on his own. He needed someone to help him. <laughs> and here again, Jesus needs our help in delivering sinners from sin. It is one thing for him to give them spiritual life. But it is another thing for them to understand that spiritual life and to live it. That is why Jesus built his church. That is exactly why Jesus built his church. Spiritual babies need the help of a spiritual parent. And here's where a lot of churches let newborn Christians down. 
you know, they'd come up here and sign a card, shake the preacher's hand, come to the altar and pray. And then we just turn them loose. You know, those of you who have had babies, you just didn't turn the baby loose and say, okay, we'll go on your own way. What did you do? Well, I remember when Eric was born. We brought him home. There was a room fixed up for him. There was a crib. We had already gotten the uh, formula and all the bottles, and there were diapers. Not these paper things, these cloth diapers. Anybody remember cloth diapers? And uh, uh, there was a diaper pail even to put the diapers when they needed to be put in. So there was a lot of preparation made before we brought the baby home. And, you know, when he would cry out and say, well, you know, there's, there's a bottle in the refrigerator. Go get it and, you know, warm it up, Eric. Go ahead and do it. He was not capable of doing that. Mom or dad had to go warm up the bottle and pick him up and stick the thing in his mouth. And then, you know, lurk, 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 lurk. It went down. And then, you know, you had to do the thing Put him on your shoulder and pat him on the back and then he worked down your back, you know, got all over your clothes, stuff like that. That's the facts of life about having babies, isn't it, you know? All right. Well, the same thing with spiritual babies. They need to be nurtured. They need to be taken care of. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 2, the Bible says, Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, as newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. People newly saved from their sins are spiritually newborn babies. There is a new life that begins. And this new life <coughs> is the exact opposite of the old life. Now, some things are automatic because of the spiritual and moral change that takes place. But notice what the Apostle Peter said. Lay aside all malice. Lay aside all deceit. Lay aside all hypocrisy, envy, evil speaking. Who, to whom is he talking? He's talking to newborn babes. He's talking to new Christians. And he's saying, look, there's, there's a change in lifestyle because you've been born again. Now, you are aware of the sins that you committed that you've repented of. And you've told God you don't ever want to go back to those things. And God forgave you. But listen, there are some other things about being a Christian, about living for God that you may not realize yet. You know, you cannot have malice in your heart towards other people. You cannot be deceitful. You cannot be a hypocrite. You get the idea? These are things that people have to be taught about. Okay? And who is going to teach them? The spiritual baby, parents. As with babies, they do have life. And they need love and care. Spiritual babies have that new life. And they need love and care. As the church, we must nurture spiritual babies so they can be healthy and grow. And one thing we are to do is to be sure that they receive proper nourishment. To desire the sincere milk of the Word. They need proper teaching from God's Word. Because you see, it is the user's manual for the Christian experience. Newborn babes, they need to come to church regularly. They need to come to Sunday morning and Sunday evening and to Wednesday because we consider the Word of God in those particular services. Okay? They need to come to Sunday school. And they need to come to other activities that are word-oriented because that's how they learn these things. You just don't hand them a list of things when they're here at the altar praying and say, here, do all these. It takes time. 
just as with a baby, it takes time. That baby needs to, to feed and to exercise and to play and to do things, and it begins to grow. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. The Bible says, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. As babies grow into older childhood, they need stronger food. And spiritually, that is the deeper things from God's Word. We start them off on milk and spiritual pablum, but they need to graduate to junior food and to big kid food and finally eat off the table with mom and dad. You know, fried chicken and roast beef and uh, spinach and all those good things. They need that. As children need parents to train them, new Christians need shepherding. You see, there are do's and don'ts about living for God, some of which are quite natural to know, but other things which may be appear may appear to be a little bit more obscure to the new Christian at first. They need spiritual parents. They need spiritual big brothers and sisters. You see, there are spiritual dangers of which the new Christian must be informed by experienced Christians so that these newborn babes will not be overtaken by sin. They need that example of your life. They need to hear you pray. They need to hear you testify. They need to hear you exhort the Word of God. They need to know that you have a devotional life. They need to see that you are faithful to come to church regularly. It's not just a every once in a while thing with you. It's part of who you are. It's part of your life. They need to see that you are a person of moral standing and moral strength. That you do not waver in that moral strength. And they also need to see that you are humble. And that you still are growing and maturing in the things of God yourself. And also as children do things that do get them hurt every once in a while. New Christians most likely will do the same thing spiritually. And they will need mature saints to come alongside and to comfort them. To pick them up and dust them off so that they can keep living for God. You know, we don't want the new convert to get overcome by sin. But you know, it can happen. And that's going to be discouraging to that person because, look, I, I went through repentance and I told God I didn't want to sin anymore, but here I did it again. So what are we going to do? Wag our finger in their face and say, bad boy, bad girl? No, we need to come alongside, okay? Yeah, what you did was not good. You shouldn't be doing that. But listen, God still loves you. God forgives you. Get up and let's go on. Tell God you're sorry. And ask God to help you to be wiser. And to listen next time that you're tempted to do the, that thing. And ask God for grace to be faithful and true. See, that's how babies learn. They learn from parents. You know, all three of our boys had to learn to talk. Where did they learn to talk from? Hearing mom and dad talk. Okay. New Christians. Learn about the Christian life from those around them. The believers around them. And then Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13. And he himself, meaning Jesus Christ, gave some to be apostles and some prophets, some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. 
This tells me that the church is essential for Christian living. We can't get along without the church. Loose him and set him free. The church is important to the new convert and to those that have been living for God for any length of time. So it is essential for Christian living. That is why God has gone to great lengths to call and to qualify ministers to minister in the church. He lists some kinds of ministers here. Some are called to be apostles. Some are called to be prophets. Some are called to be evangelists. Some are called to be pastors. And some are called to be teachers. All of these gifts of ministry, all these kinds of ministry are important in the church because it is through these ministries and people that Jesus calls to these ministries that the church is built, the church is strength, and that the people of God are equipped to be the saints of God. They're taught how to live a holy life. And it is through these ministries that we are brought into the unity of the faith. We are taught what is important about the faith. We are taught from God's Word. And we are taught what it means to let Christ live His life in our lives. So, Christ builds His church through people being saved from sin and being established in a steady experience of salvation from sin. So, church, our job is to loose them and to let them go after Christ has called them out of a life of sin. Jesus, in this lesson, challenges you today. If you are committing sin and you are trapped in a tomb of sin, Jesus commands you to come forth, to repent of your sins, to believe in the gospel, and to seek God's forgiveness. God is faithful to save you and to change your life for the better. So, your challenge is to hear the voice of Jesus calling you to come forth. We have taught the gospel. We have rolled away the stone. And today, if you're sitting here, if you're listening to this over the internet, Jesus is calling out to you. Come forth. Repent. Believe in the gospel. And call out to God to save you from sin. Now, if you have been saved from sin, Jesus is commanding you to loose those He raises from spiritual death and to set them free. That's your job. That's your responsibility. Show them Christian love and support. When that one humbles himself, herself at the altar of prayer and prays through, be there to encourage that one. I don't mean just hug that person when they get up from the altar bench and go back to their seat. That would be a good thing to do. But encourage them. Give them a call on the phone during the week. See how they're doing. Drop them a postcard. Write them an email. When they come to church next Sunday, Hi, how are you? How was your week? I've been praying for you. Support them. Support them. Help them to get grounded in the Word of God. Share your testimony with them. And exhort to them from the Word of God. And be there to help them when they go through difficult times. Stop and think. Somebody was there for you when you came out of that tomb. Be there for those Jesus raises from spiritual death. Loose them. Set them free. Help them along the way. 
And Jesus Christ will build His church through those actions. Amen.